You then, Miletus, contriver of wicked deeds, shall be a feast for many, and a splendid prize. Your wives shall wash the feet of many a long-haired men, and others shall care for our shrine at Didyma. Herodotus Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 48, Anatolia, Conflicts Continue. Last episode we saw the Persians begin incorporating the regions of the Lydian Empire into the administrative apparatus of the Persian Empire. Cyrus had left this task to his subordinate commanders, as other campaigns were being arranged elsewhere in the empire, to further extend its borders. Cyrus marching back inland with his army, saw the Lydians hostile to Persian rule attempt to regain control. Though their revolt would be short-lived, the Lydians and the Greek cities along the western coast would be punished for their involvement in the uprising, seeing them now all becoming fully incorporated into the Persian Empire. The Greek cities had been governed by tyrannies, where many had been unpopular in the times before the Lydian and Persian subjugation. Now though, these tyrants were acting in the interests of the Persians, ensuring the tribute demands of their cities were being met. A generation under Persian rule would pass, where finally a combination of the dissatisfaction with tyrannical rule, the pressures of Persian tribute, and the ambitions of a single man would see revolt in Ionia break out. The various Greek cities in Ionia and other regions would unite to attempt to gain their freedom from Persian rule. The Athenians and the Eritreans would also become involved in the revolt when pleas for help were sent to the mainland. In 498 BC, the first action of the revolt took place, with the Greeks marching on Sardis and capturing the city. Unfortunately for them though, the Acropolis remained in Persian hands. With the standoff developing and the Persian garrisons from surrounding areas mobilising, the Greeks withdrew back to the coast. A Persian force was able to catch up to the Greeks and force a battle outside of Ephesus, where the Greeks were soundly beaten. Though this was only the beginning, and the revolt would drag on for a number of more years. This episode, we will be looking at the events after the failed attempt on Sardis. This would see more operations take place around the western parts of Anatolia, though the chronology of events becomes a little fuzzy. We will then turn to Persian counter-operations in the region, as they now mobilise to crush the revolt. This will then see us seeing the Ionian revolt fail, and the Persian focus would now shift to mainland Greece. With the Ionian cities suffering the consequences of their attempt to rebel against Persian rule, they would now fulfil their tribute requirements in the form of men for the army and navy. This will see us shifting to their involvement during the Greek and Persian wars, with the major events of the war just serving as a backdrop this time around. Once we have then followed the war through to its conclusion, we will then look at what the Greek victory would mean for the Ionian Greeks and their cities in western Anatolia. So let's now pick up on events where we left them last episode, with the Greeks being defeated outside of Ephesus after their failed attempt on Sardis. The defeat at Ephesus would mark the end of aid from the Greek mainland. The reality of the situation seems far different to them than what Aristagoras had presented to the Athenians back in Athens the previous year. Aristagoras, though, knew there was no going back. He had seen and heard what had happened to those who went against the Persian Empire. An example would need to be made of him and the Ionians. For this reason, he would send many more messages to the Greeks across the Aegean, looking for further assistance, though he would be met with silence. At this stage, it seems the revolt had only been active within Ionia itself, but with the pleas from the various city-states coming across the Aegean not being answered, attention had turned to bringing in the regions around Ionia into the revolt. It would appear that the campaign season for 498 had ended and efforts were now being placed in diplomacy and gathering support. The Persian army that had defeated the Greeks at Ephesus appears to have just been a scratch force, but ill-suited to mounting a campaign through the region. After the battle, it most likely returned to Artaphernes back in Sardis, and news of the attack on Sardis would have filtered its way to Susa. With this news, the Persians would also be busy making arrangements to deal with the revolt and unleash a strong response once the fair weather months returned. Revolts were one activity the Persians would not tolerate. Their response was usually swift and harsh. If these revolts were allowed to gain momentum and not be punished, it would just encourage other regions to follow suit. Firstly, we hear that the Ionians sailed to the Hellespont and made it all the way to Byzantium. Herodotus tells us that the cities along this route were made subject to the Ionians. I feel this language is a little strong to perhaps what really took place. As we have seen in the past episodes on the periphery, Byzantium had been placed under Persian control previous to the revolt, though their hold and influence in the region appears to have been the strongest when campaigns into Thrace were underway. It would seem the pro-Persian tyrants in many of these cities were probably overthrown, which would be an act of rebellion in itself. This by extension would see these cities enter into the revolt, now seeing it spread north. 
This would have been alarming for the Persians, as all the cities were situated along the Hellespont, a major trade route connecting the Black Sea to the Aegean. The tribute they would have collected from these ports, one can imagine, could have hardly been trivial. The revolt would also spread into the lands south of the Ionian Greeks, into the region of Caria. It would appear that the efforts had been made the previous year to bring the Carians into an alliance with the Ionians, before the attack on Sardis took place. Though, in the infancy of the revolt, and as the Ionians were still arranging themselves, the Carian city saw no incentive to revolt. But now, with the revolt spreading north, and appearing to gain momentum, perhaps now it seemed that there was a chance that they could break free of the Persians. Also added to this calculation would have been the news of the Ionians having burnt down Sardis. Although the Greeks retreated and were beaten in battle, this is not what the Ionians would have highlighted. They would have presented their ability to have entered and destroyed Sardis as evidence of the weakness of the Persian Empire in Western Anatolia. The effects of the spread of the revolt in the early stages of 497 BC would also reach the island of Cyprus, though we hear they would rebel against the Persians on their own accord. Herodotus indicates that there was an anti-Persian faction within the Cyprian city of Salamis, who had attempted to argue for revolt earlier. Now though, inspired by the activities in Ionia, measures were taken to see that they would also revolt. It seems this was achieved by the king of the city of Salamis being overthrown by his brother. Herodotus says, He exerted the utmost pressure on his brother to rebel, but once he saw that he was not succeeding, he watched for an occasion when Gorgas, the king went outside the city of Salamis, and then Onelius, together with his partisans, locked the gates and shut Gorgas out. This would then see the city fall into the hands of the anti-Persian faction, but they were also able to persuade all the other Cyprian cities to join, bar one, the southern city of Amathaos. The southern port city would be besieged by the revolting Cyprian cities, while Gorgas would flee into the Persians' lands. So, we can see here, from Herodotus' account, that in the space of a year, the revolt that would be ignited in Miletus would now spread through to the other Ionian cities, and then north to the cities along the Hellespont up to Byzantium. It would then also filter down into Carian lands southward, then seeing the cities of Cyprus encouraged by events to also revolt. A great part of the western edge of the Persian Empire had now entered into open revolt, though as the revolt was reaching its furthest extent, we would hear that Darius would finally receive news of the burning at Sardis and a Persian response would now be set into motion to bring stability back to the western parts of the empire. As I have pointed out, it is difficult to ascertain a clear unfolding of events during this period. One would think Darius would have learnt pretty quickly of the destruction at Sardis, especially with the highly effective royal road that stretched back east into the empire. Though when and how long after the action at Sardis each region revolted, we are unsure. What we can take away here is that, by the beginning of the campaigning season of 497 BC, all the regions were in open revolt and Darius was in the process of mounting a response. Also, during this hazy period where Darius likely led to the revolt, we see Herodotus bring Histiaeus, the previous tyrant of Miletus, back into proceedings. As we spoke about, it seems hard to believe that Histiaeus had an involvement in the revolt in Ionia breaking out. From Herodotus' account, it appears he had not been in Miletus since 513 BC having then been in Thrace and then held close in Susa, due to the suspicions around him. Herodotus then presents Darius questioning Histiaeus on his involvement of the revolt and destruction at Sardis, with him lying through his teeth on his part in the events. Histiaeus is then able to convince Darius that he had no knowledge of the revolt, and further to that, he convinces him to lead him to travel to Miletus to talk to the rebels into surrendering themselves. As well as the Persians' common practice of attempting diplomacy before battle, I think the story of Histiaeus deceiving Darius in Herodotus may be a story created in hindsight of events. It appears Histiaeus may well have been a trusted subject to the Persian court. He had served the empire when he was a tyrant to Miletus with no inklings of revolt, while he also served the Persian army on campaign, protecting the path of retreat across the Danube River. For his service, he would be granted lands in Thracian territory giving us every reason to believe he was fulfilling his role to the empire. It perhaps seems more reasonable that Darius saw Histiaeus as being a conduit in attempting to open diplomatic channels with the rebel leaders. We often see the Persians resorting to messengers who had a direct connection to the people they were looking to negotiate with, though perhaps with Histiaeus' arrival in Ionia, he would learn of the true extent of the revolt, and now away from the Persian court was convinced to change his alignment. Perhaps then presenting his willingness for the revolt all along and even his part in its inception due to his ties to the city. 
Though I feel if Histiaeus was sent back to Miletus, it was probably after the series of campaigns we're about to talk about. This period will also mark one of the first Persian responses to the revolt, this being directed at Cyprus. Word had made it back to the empire, presumably with Gorgas, the ousted king of Salamis. News would then arrive on Cyprus that a Persian force was preparing to reclaim the island, with the sources appearing to have come from within the mainland regions of the Persian Empire, as the Cyprians would have had enough time to send messages to the Ionians asking for their assistance. Things in Ionia would seem to be fairly stable at this stage, with no threat of Persian attack just yet, as we hear the Ionians would come to Cyprus in force. Discussions would take place on how best to deal with the coming attack, with it known that the Phoenicians would be operating the navy, while the Persians would field a land army to attack the Cyprian cities. The Ionians would choose to take responsibility of defending the sea. We perhaps see here that their motives coming to Cyprus' as aid was also to protect the waters along the Anatolian coast. Herodotus would have the Ionians address the talks over who would be responsible for what in the coming battle. The common council of Ionia sent us here to guard the sea, not to hand over our ships to you and to fight the Persians on land. The Persian force would eventually arrive and would be landed on the island where they would be drawn up on the plains of Salamis, where the decisive battle would take place. Meanwhile, the naval battle between the Ionians and Phoenicians would also unfold. We get no details on the battle other than that the Ionians would be victorious, securing the Anatolian coastline for now. However, on land, the Cyprians would be defeated, with it seeming treachery had been a factor. The tyrant of Curium had been brought by the Persians and would play traitor to the rest of the Cyprian army. We hear he had a substantial force under his command, which probably saw a great part of the Cyprian line dissolve. This would see a decisive victory for the Persians on land, and most of the leaders responsible for the revolt would be killed in the rout. With the defeat on the field, the various other revolting cities of Cyprus would now all be placed under siege and would eventually succumb to the Persians, with the last falling four months after the campaign on Cyprus began. This would see the revolt that had broken out on Cyprus nearly a year earlier come to an end, with the island being absorbed back into the Persian Empire. Though the Persians would also have other campaigns in progress, with it seeming a Persian army had been directed at cities along the Hellespont during the campaigning season of 497 as well. During the organisation for operations in Western Anatolia, Darius would have three armies assembled to bring the regions back under control. He would place in command of each army a son-in-law of his, Darius's, Hyames, and Ortanes. For this phase of the counteroffensive, the events in Rodas' account become a little confusing and are not consistent with other areas that he describes. For example, he indicates that these three commanders are the ones who caught up with the Ionians outside of Ephesus, and after defeating them, began laying waste to the Ionian cities. Though we see, and would continue to see, the Ionians assisting in other areas to see the spread of the revolt and aid in the fighting in other areas that would take place after Ephesus. Trying to make sense of Herodotus' account, it would seem Ionia would be one of the last regions that would be attacked in force and brought under control during the revolt. So I have been and will continue to present events in what appears to be a more logical chronology, though keep in mind this is just my interpretation. The three armies may well have been present in Western Anatolia early on after the attack on Sardis, though perhaps mounting small operations into the revolting lands, as they were having their armies assembled for larger campaigns. It appears the first campaign to be launched was against the cities of the Hellespont, which makes sense, this being a vital trade route. We hear that Darius would lead his army northwest, where he would then begin reducing the cities along the Hellespont, heading east. Herodotus says he would capture one city each day during the campaign. How accurate this is, is questionable, just thinking of the time needed to march the army and prepare for battle and then recover. Though it could be possible that the army had split into multiple forces, or diplomacy had in fact captured the cities without force. Also, I can imagine that the cities along the Hellespont may well have fallen quickly, as the revolt seems to have only just been taking hold. We saw the Hellespont would be incited into revolt in 497, with it then seeming this campaign was also taking place in the same year, probably towards the end of the campaigning season. Though it would appear the campaign along the Hellespont would be abandoned without all objectives being met. More troubles were brewing, though this time south of Ionia in Caria, 
where we saw the Onians had also convinced the cities to join the rebellion in 497. Darius, we are told, on his march to the next target along the Hellespont, would receive news of urgent assistance needed in quelling the revolt in Carrion lands. This would see him abandon, for now, the campaign in the Hellespont, and take his army south. Though, it appears not long after his march south, Hermes, who had originally been campaigning around the Black Sea, marched with his army and began securing the cities along the Hellespont that Darius had originally reduced. Darius' army would march south before then following the Meander River east into Carrion lands, in what appears to have been the closing stages of 497. The Carrions would learn of the approach of the Persian force with enough time to arrange a response and fight them on the ground of their own choosing. The Carrions assembled at a place known as the White Pillars, was in the region where the Meander and Mazaeus River met. The Persians would cross the Meander, with apparently the Carrions allowing them to do this as part of their strategy, so that the Persians would have the river at their backs. The Battle of the Mazaeus River would then be joined, with us hearing that the battle would be long and hard fought by both sides. In the end, apparently the superior numbers of the Persian force would be the deciding factor. We are told 10,000 Carrions would fall during this battle, most likely during the rout that would have occurred, while the Persians would lose some 2,000 men. It would appear that the Battle of the Mazaeus River would be the last of 497. We are told that the Carrions would retreat into their lands where deliberations on their next moves would take place. I think at this point a pause in the Carrion campaign was taking place. The Persians, if the numbers are correct, although victorious, had suffered substantial losses, and it would also seem winter would have been coming on by this stage though the Carrion campaign would continue into 496. During the winter, the Carrions had been demoralised to where discussions of surrender to the Persians or if they should flee their lands were taking place. It would seem likely the previous year that when they had learned of the Persian advance, they would have sent messages to the Ionians looking for aid. Well, it appears that with the approach of the warmer months in 496 and the Ionian forces back from their Cyprian adventure, they now had set out to assist the Carrions. With news of fresh forces on the way, the Carrion's resolve appears to have been restored, and the defence would continue. Another set-piece battle would occur, though a similar result would take place, with the Ionians taking the brunt of the casualties. We have very little details of the battle, and are not even sure if the Ionians had any more involvement after it. Though it appears the Carrion's switched tact and opted for more guerrilla-style tactics. The Persians now began to focus on retaking the cities in Carrier, this probably saw the Persian army split into smaller groups. The Carrions now resorted to hit and run raids and night attacks. Herodotus presents all of this wrapped up in one large ambush on the Persian army at night as they march deeper into Carrion territory. Though I feel a more prolonged campaign of partisan warfare seems more likely after two decisive defeats. Nevertheless, the Persians would suffer very badly with the continued fighting, with even the Persian commander Darius being killed. At this stage, the campaign and Carrier appears to have been somewhat bogged down, with Rodus leaving proceedings at this point. As I have indicated, it appears that the region of Ionia was not the focus of major offensives right away. There were probably Persian forces operating in Ionian lands, though not to the extent that we have seen north and south. Rodus' account indicates that there were operations in Ionia early on, though it is hard to reconcile it with other events in his account to give a clear picture of what was happening when. One big reason I think there were only limited operations in Ionia taking place is the fact that the Ionians were able to send substantial forces to aid the Cyprians in 497 and then the Carrians in early 496. Perhaps after the troubles in Carrier is when we would see a major push occur in Ionia. We hear this is where the third Persian commander, Ortanes, together with Artaphernes, the Persian governor of Sardis, would direct their forces. Herodotus tells us that they had captured two coastal cities which were both close to the border between Ionian and Aeolian lands. If this was the case, this may have seen the Ionian's connection to Aeolia and the Hellespont cut, with it seeming the Persians were isolating and reducing the revolting regions in turn. It would seem around this point, Aristagoras would leave Miletus and according to Herodotus, abandon the revolt altogether, personally seeing there was no escape for him if he stayed. He is presented as running away from what he had started and leaving others to deal with the mess. Aristagoras would end up sailing with his supporters to Thrace and occupy the settlement that Histiaeus had fortified, though after partaking in events and expanding in this region, he and his followers would be killed. Although this is how Herodotus presents Aristagoras' actions, other explanations have also been put forward to explain his behaviour. 
One alternate line of thinking sees Aristagoras now in a position of isolation with the Ionia cut off from the Persian forces, looking to gather more support and resources to continue fighting. He had familial ties to the region in Thrace through Histiaeus, so it was seen as his best chance to achieve these goals. While another suggests Aristagoras may have gone into exile either voluntarily in an attempt to save the Ionians from suffering the full force of the Persians, or by force, as the Ionians now finding themselves in a precarious position blamed him for their situation. Have you been enjoying the series and want to show your support in some way? You can visit www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button. Here you will find many ways you can help the series grow, from subscribing, getting involved in social media, and leaving reviews where you listen to your podcasts. Other options also include assisting with my Amazon wishlist for resources and supporting the series on Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee. The support I have been receiving so far has been fantastic. So a big thank you to everyone who has been helping me grow the series. We now get to the episode where Histiaeus makes it back to Miletus, after Aristagoras had departed for Thrace. Herodotus presents this as an attempt to deceive Darius and take control of the revolt himself, though I can't help but wonder if he originally set out with the intention of talking the Ionians into surrendering now that Ionia was isolated from its allies. Plus the Persian armies had been in action for at least two campaigning seasons now, and had suffered some losses. If they could end the revolt without a fight, this would have been in the Persians' interests. Though at the end of the day, it is difficult to tell the true intentions of Histiaeus. Though it could be well possible that Histiaeus' intentions could have changed as the environment around him also changed. Rodgers would have him travel through Sardis on his way to Ionia, where he would meet with Artaphernes, who we are told was suspicious of his motives, supposedly seeing what Darius couldn't. Though once arriving in Ionia, the Ionians were suspicious of his intentions, with him being arrested on the island of Chios. Apparently though he was able to convince them of pure motives for the Ionian cause. Though when it came to Miletus, the Ionians we are told, after ridding themselves of one tyrant, Aristagoras, they were in no mood to replace him with another. He would even attempt to gain control by force, but would fail and be wounded in the attempt. It appears even if Aristagoras had been involved in leading the revolt, it would seem the Ionians had got used to running affairs as a collective. We hear Aristagoras had set up a board of generals, while we also hear of the Ionians making decisions to aid others as a group. And as we will see soon, another joint meeting would be held. Anyway, Histiaeus would not be able to gain the support of the Ionians to lead them, or have any influence with them to work towards Persian interests, if that was his true aim. We hear he was able to secure eight ships from Lesbos, and would make for the Hellespont, where he and his followers would set up a base and prey on any shipping flowing out of the region that did not have the Ionians' intentions at hand. This perhaps indicating he did favour the Ionians' cause, or his change in attitudes while in Ionia had been discovered by the Persians, seeing him being unable to return back to Susa. This is where we will leave Histiaeus once again, though he will make one other appearance before we are done. So by the time that all the events that we have currently spoken of had played out, it was perhaps sometime around late 495 BC. The Persians by this stage seem to have broken up the revolt in a number of areas. This appears then to have seen the revolt just now to be confined to the region of Ionia, with the closing of 495. With the closing of 495, the Persians could now reorganise and refresh their armies that had been campaigning for at least a couple of years. Then 494 would see them being able to focus on stamping out the rebellion in Ionian lands, though the best way to do this would be to beat the Ionian force in a decisive engagement as well as focusing on Miletus, the seat of the revolt. The Ionians would learn of the Persian intentions on shifting all their forces towards Miletus. The various Ionian representatives would meet at the Pan-Ionium to discuss how they would meet this threat. The Pan-Ionium was a sacred meeting place that was dedicated to Poseidon, and which we hear about back when the Ionian Defence League was active. The decision would be taken that the defence of the city would be left to the people of Miletus, while the various Ionian cities would come together and fight the Persians at sea. Perhaps after their success over the Phoenician ships off Cyprus, the Ionians saw sea battle as their best chance at halting the Persian operations. One feels here it wasn't the Ionians picking the field of battle, but rather responding to the Persian operations. It would seem now that they had more control over the sea, with Cyprus and Carrier effectively brought under control. 
What would take place in 494 would be the last major set-piece battle of the Revolt, which would be known as the Battle of Lade. Now, I covered Lade back when doing our episodes on the Ionian Revolt, so I will not cover it with the same depth as before. Lade was a small island, situated between Mikale and Miletus, and would be where the two navies would array themselves for battle. The Ionians had arrived earlier and had time to prepare their forces, though we get the impression they would be ill-prepared for the coming battle. This coming through the story Herodotus tells of the Phocaean commander Dionysius, who would attempt to train and organise the various contingents into a united force, though after days of hard work they would begin to refuse to take their posts. We need to remember that Herodotus is often critical of the Ionians in his account, however it does appear that there was a level of disunity, probably due to the prospect of the Persians squashing the revolt, and some cities beginning to lose their resolve. As we will see, this was also due to contribute to the Ionian defeat at Lade. We also hear that the Persian combined force had arrived in the area some time before the naval battle, where they would use diplomacy to break apart the Ionian alliance. The Persians attempt to break away some of the cities failed in the immediate term, and they would set out with their 600 ships and the Greeks would come to meet them. The Battle of Lade would now get underway, though Herodotus would describe the details of the battle as very confused with many conflicting reports. As it would be a decisive Persian victory, we also see him saying, I cannot relate for certain which of the Ionian contingents fought well and which fought ill, for the reports are confused, everybody blaming everyone else. Though what appears to be the tipping point in the battle was when the Samians, who had previously been disheartened at the lack of cohesion before the battle, abandoned the line. This saw others following suit due to being left exposed and the Ionian line was now vulnerable. The Ionians that were left, we are told, would fight bravely but ultimately, the Battle of Lade would be an overwhelming Persian victory, seeing the effective end of the revolt in Ionia. With the defeat of the Ionian forces, Miletus was now vulnerable from land and sea. The city would be besieged and inevitably fall. The Persians would kill most of the men and send the women and children into slavery. With the fall of Miletus, Histiaeus would learn of the defeat and the Persian intention to start reducing the rest of Ionia. He would now mount his own campaign and try and reignite resistance sailing from the Hellespont and to the lands just off the coast. Although he would gather some support from around the islands, once meeting the Persians in battle, his force would be defeated and Histiaeus would surrender, thinking he could use his previous relationship with Darius to save himself, though unfortunately for him it was Artaphernes he would be taken to, and being fully aware of his supposed treachery, Artaphernes would have him impaled. The Persians would then begin by marching on other Ionian cities during 493. Resistance in the region would now die down very quickly, especially after the fall of Miletus. Effectively, the revolt was over and the Persians had brought the Ionians back into the fold. Inevitably, Persian reprisals would take place, not just to punish the Ionians for their revolt and their refusal to surrender, but also to make an example to the other regions of the Persian Empire to show the consequences of attempting to break away. In Ionia, many of the men were killed, while many of the women were sent into slavery. Boys were castrated, becoming eunuchs at the Persian court, while many girls were sent there for Darius. In a number of the cities, the most important buildings, the shrines and temples, were burnt to the ground, providing some vengeance for the destruction at Sardis some five years earlier. Persia's attitudes towards Ionia and its people would change very quickly after punishments had been dealt with. After all, the region was now back part of the Persian Empire and it was in Darius's best interest to stabilise the region to prevent a repeat of events. Artaphernes seems to have been tasked with reforming the region, where we hear representatives from all the Ionian cities met in Sardis and would create a board of judges, who would be responsible for sorting out disputes among the various cities. We also hear of reforms being made to the tribute system, where the cities would judge on the size of their lands that they controlled, and their tribute being worked out in relation to this metric though supposedly the amount was not too dissimilar to what had previously been paid. These reforms seem to suggest that Persia recognised it needed to make some form of change in Ionia to attempt to keep the peace. No doubt though, pretty much anyone who was identified as taking part in a leadership role during the revolt would have been killed or taken into slavery far away from Ionia. This would have seen the driving force of the revolt removed while Persia's reforms would have reduced the people's motivation to rebel. Though, with Ionia now back under Persian control, Darius now turned his attention west. There were still cities, not within the Persian Empire, that had supported hostilities against Persia. Athens and Eritrea had taken part in the first year of the revolt, 
and their actions at Sardis had not been forgotten. Now, we have covered the Greek and Persian Wars in quite some detail before, so I'm not going to go back over all the events blow by blow. Rather, I'm going to pop in and out of the conflict where the Ionians are present, and look at their involvement during these periods. As we have covered a number of times, the first Persian moves that we are told that would be directed at Athens and Eritrea was Mardonius' campaign, which would march through Thracian lands, with the navy shadowing off the coast in 492 BC. This would be where the navy would suffer a disaster off the coast of Mount Athos, while also the army meeting tough resistance in Thracian lands, seeing Mardonius wounded. Though before this campaign set off, a curious development would take place in Ionian lands. Herodotus tells us that Mardonius once arriving to take command of his forces in Cilicia, he sailed up the coast, and when in Ionia, he would remove the tyrants from the cities and install democratic systems. What these democratic systems were, we are unsure, and how democratic they were when compared to what developed over in Greece, would appear to be quite different. After all, they were still subject to the Persian Empire. Perhaps some form of change was made to give the appearance that the people had a say in their affairs, or at least the tyrant figure and system was removed. This would appear to be an extension of the pacification policy that the Persians had conducted through the region earlier. Plus, Mardonius would want to have ensured that the regions behind his advance would remain friendly. Mardonius' campaign would not progress any further than Thracian lands, though in 490 BC another campaign would be sent west, this time across the Aegean Sea, commanded by Datus. This would be known as the First Persian Invasion. It appears this campaign had the intention of further extending punishments to those who had interfered in Persian affairs. A number of islands would be subjected by the Persians, with Naxos and Eritrea paying heavy prices, with their cities burnt to the ground. Finally, Datus would land at the Bay of Marathon, where the Persians and Athenians, along with some Plataeans, would fight the Battle of Marathon. We hear of the Ionians and Aeolians being involved in the first Persian invasion, though the extent of their involvement we are unsure, as the only reference to them is after the Persians leave Delos, bound for Eritrea, we see Herodotus saying, taking both Ionians and Aeolians. One feels they may have participated as part of the navy, this seeming to be the strongest arm during the Ionian revolt, and for how they were to be employed later on. Once at Marathon, though, we have no references to the Ionian forces. However, at Marathon, the Persians would be defeated and would return back into the empire with a renewed effort to be planned. Ten years later, the Persians would mount their second invasion of Greece, under the new king Xerxes. This time forces would be gathered from all over the empire to take part, with a force that would march and sail being at least ten times as strong than those of the first invasion. The Ionians would be listed as providing 100 ships to the naval contingent, with no mention to them being involved in the land army, so it will be primarily the naval engagements that we'll be looking at. The first engagement that they would be involved in was at the Battle of Artemisium, which was unfolding over the same days as the Battle of Thermopylae. We don't know where in the Persian line the Ionians fought at Artemisium over the three days of clashes, but it would almost be certain that they would be there somewhere. The numbers Herodotus gives of the various contingents that made up the Persian fleet, showing the Ionians as making up a good deal of the ships. We also find that they, along with the Phoenicians, had the best reputation for naval manoeuvres. Though, as we have covered before, the fighting that took place would see the Greek fleet gain tactical victories over the three days. But if the fighting continued as it did, attrition would see the Greeks defeated. This then, along with the news of the defeat at Thermopylae, saw the Greek fleet withdraw. This is then when we see the Ionians focused on in Herodotus' account. This would be an attempt to undermine them as a reliable fighting force within the Persian fleet. Themistocles, knowing the Persians would occupy their positions the next day, took some fast ships and sailed along the coast, stopping off anywhere drinking water could be found. At these places, they made pleas to the Ionians, scratching a message into the rocks, with them reading, Men of Ionia, it is wrong that you should make war upon your fathers and help bring Greeks to subjugation. The best thing that you can do is to join our side. If this is not possible, you might at least remain neutral and ask the Carians to do the same. If you are unable to do either, but are held by compulsion so strong that it puts desertion out of the question, there is still another course open to you. In the next battle, remember that you and we are of the same blood that our quarrel with Persia arose originally on your account, and fight badly. There were probably two intentions with this message, one being that the Ionians would take this message to heart 
and seek to sabotage the Persian naval efforts. Though, one would imagine that the Ionians being part of such an overwhelming force would have suffered serious consequences. Plus, how motivated were they to revolt against the Persians again? They had just suffered tremendously only a few years ago. The Persians had made the effort to bring the calm to the region, and all the potential leaders from the previous revolt were probably either dead or had been sent to other parts of the empire. The second intention was probably a more realistic scenario. This would be to undermine the Persian commander's confidence in the Ionian contingent, sowing the seeds of distrust and suspicion. This hopefully relegating them to support roles or removing them from the fleet entirely, therefore eliminating 100 triremes that would need to be faced during the next battle. Though unfortunately for the Greeks, this tactic didn't have the required effect, as they would soon find themselves in direct contact with their cousins from across the Aegean. The Battle of Salamis would be fought in the straits between the island of Salamis and the Attic coast. It would take place a few weeks to a month after the withdrawal from Artemisium, with the Persian land forces also having captured Athens. This time we would hear the Ionians in the line of battle, situated across the straits from the Lacedaemonians. As the ships got underway, we hear that a few of the Ionians had heeded Themistocles' message and hung back. Though how Herodotus knew this, we are unsure. One can imagine there would have been stragglers all across the line with such numbers of ships in the water. Anyway, for the majority of the Ionian ships, they would advance on the Greek line with the rest of the Persian fleet. Herodotus then focuses on one particular Greek from western Anatolia, Artemisia, the queen of Halicarnassus, Herodotus' hometown. He describes how Xerxes was impressed with her performance in battle, where he would say, My men have turned into women, and my women into men. This would be due to him witnessing his fleet beginning to waver and would eventually retreat. During this period where the line was starting to waver, some Phoenician commanders who had made it back to shore approached Xerxes with allegations that the Ionians and their treachery was the reason that their ships were destroyed. The interesting thing here is that the Ionians and Phoenicians were posted on complete opposite sides of the Persian line. If they had gotten entangled, the fighting by this stage must have become quite confused. Though Xerxes would then observe Ionian ships conduct great exploit against an Athenian ship and then against a crew from Aegina. This would then see the Phoenicians, seeking the execution of the Ionian commanders, executed themselves. Salamis would end up being an unmitigated disaster for the Persians. The fleet, in no shape to fight again, was sent back east across the Aegean to winter, though it appears news of the Persian performance in Greece had travelled back into Ionian lands. Whispers of a revolt may have begun to start circulating again, and could be a very real possibility given the right circumstances. Herodotus also cites this as being another reason the Persian fleet would head back to the Anatolian coast. By the next year, in 479 BC, the situation in Greece looked quite different. Xerxes had retreated back to the empire with a large portion of the army. He had left Mardonius in command of the remaining Persian forces. Troubles over the winter, after Salamis, had plagued the Hellenic League's cohesiveness. But as the new campaigning season began, they would be united once again. In Greece, the Battle of Plataea would take place, which would see Persian forces ejected from Greek lands. On the sea, another battle would develop, taking place according to tradition on the same day. This battle would have its origins in part due to pleas from Greeks across the Aegean seeking support and assisting revolt once again. First, Ionian representatives had attempted to persuade the Greek fleet to sail. Then later, men from Samos would also make the same pleas. The Greek fleet would eventually sail east across the Aegean, chasing the Persians from Samos and meeting them at Mycale, where instead of a naval battle, a land battle would take place. Now back in Persian-controlled lands and after their failure in Greece, the Persians had now seen the Ionians and other Greek Anatolians as being a liability. The whisperings of a revolt were probably getting louder and making the Persian commanders very nervous. Leotychides, the Greek commander, would follow a similar tact as Themistocles at Artemisium, calling out a message to the Ionians before landing at the shore of Mycale. Just before the Battle of Mycale took place, the Persians had disarmed the Samians and left them in camp, while the Milesians were sent up Mount Mycale to guard the passes. Supposedly, this was due to them knowing the lay of the land, with the area just north of Miletus. Though Herodotus assures us they were sent up Mycale, away from the army, as they were no longer trusted. There must have been some truth to the rumours and suggestions that revolt was in the air, as when the battle had joined and the Persians pushed back into the camp, the Ionians would now turn on their Persian masters. The Samians, along with the other Ionians, 
would engage the Persians unarmed, tipping the balance of the fighting in the camp. The Milesians would guide the Persians attempting to flee the slaughter through the mountains, but bring them back down a pass to where the enemy were. Eventually they too would join the battle down below, with Herodotus saying they proved to be their bitterest enemies. This basically saw where we ended our look at the Persian invasions and the Greek defeat of them in the series. The region of Ionia would now enter a second revolt, with Persian forces suffering another decisive defeat at Mycale. There were some other operations that took place that we looked at, where the Athenians had begun liberating the cities in the region of the Hellespont. This seeing Persian control around the western part of the empire begin to recede. Though what to do about the Ionians in Anatolia would become a point of contention between the Athenians and Spartans. Sparta wanted to see the Ionians brought back across into the Greek mainland, settled north of Attica. This may have served Sparta's interests, but it was at complete odds of that of the Athenians. The Ionians and the Greeks of Anatolia will continue to feature heavily in the narrative as we move forward in the series, where the competing interests of the Spartans and Athenians would play out on the backdrop of offensive operations against Persian control around the coastal regions. This will also see the formation of the Delian League that the Ionians would become a part of. Its purpose to provide a collective defence against future Persian threats, though as we will see, there would be unintended consequences for all of Greece. Well, this brings us to the end of our narrative of the Greek periphery in Anatolia, though I do have one more episode that relates to this topic. Next episode, I'll be releasing an interview I did with Professor Vanessa Gorman, who wrote the book Miletus, The Ornament of Ionia. In this talk, we focus on the history of Miletus from its earliest times up to where we just covered in this episode. I had previously held off going into much depth on Miletus, as I was anticipating this interview would provide the relevant depth I was looking for. Anyway, I hope you look forward to that talk before we then move on with our narrative, picking out back after the Greek victories of the Persian invasions. Thank you everyone for your continued support, and a big shout out to all of those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting it on Patreon, and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the Support the Button series, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series, and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece, or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over on the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time for episode 49, Miletus, The Ornament of Ionia, with Professor Vanessa Gorman.